Thank you so much, Lady Love. Happy Sabbath. Boy, I tell you, it's been a wonderful day. It's been exciting. I've done a little crying, a little laughing, did a lot of laughing. But it's been a joy to be with you. It's wonderful to just come around and, and uh, visit and hear the exciting testimonies and, and get to know uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Uh, it, it's always good to be back here at 3ABN. Uh, I think it's been, no, oh, 25 years or so. Well, it's longer than that. It's before, yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, I'm looking at Karen. Well, I'm doing some math in my head right now, and I'm not very good at that. I, but yeah, it must be 27 years. I guess because three of you started airing a program we taped at Carmichael. It's been over 27 years ago, and uh, so yeah, it's been fun just wa watching the way the Lord has blessed the ministry and um, seeing it grow. I remember when I first started coming, everything was all in one building over there, and I'd come in late at night from Sacramento and. And Mitch, who's here, he just prayed with me. He was there way, he'd be up all night long at master control watching the dials. I'd bang in the door. They'd let me go in. They had this attic bedroom, guest room you'd stay in. And, and uh, it's just been fun to see how God is blessed and blossomed. You know, as long as you keep the main thing the main thing, God is going to bless. I'll tell you why. Why did Jesus come into the world? To seek and to save the lost. What are the last words that Jesus said as he ascended to heaven? Go and teach all nations. Now, Jesus wants to see people saved. And the most important thing to the Lord is that people get saved. If you say, Lord, will you send me? Use me in reaching others. He will bless you. Even if you don't do everything right, he'd rather do something and maybe make a mistake than to do nothing very well. And so I think if we make an effort and say, Lord, I might not be perfect, but I want you to use me in reaching others, he will bless you. Amen. Didn't the Lord use the apostles to go out teaching and preaching? And they still had a few things to learn along the way, didn't they? So if, don't wait until you feel like you're perfect before God uses you. If you start with a dream and a vision to reach others, God will bless you and he'll teach you in the process. Take my word for it. So it has just been uh, a joy to see how God has blessed over the years. We're going to be talking in keeping with our theme, Living Above the Crowd. Today, the message is to avoid grasshopper thinking. And I'd like to begin with just a little story, amazing fact, if you will. I love history. Uh, I'm reading another book right now about Magellan's journey around the world, and I'm fascinated by history. I keep stopping Karen and telling her, this is what's happening, and this is what's happening. It's so incredible. One of the other great adventures that I enjoyed reading about was the Lewis and Clark expedition. In fact, I don't know if you've ever fantasized if you could go back in time when you would want to go. I know there's a lot of places I wouldn't want to go back in time, but one place I thought would really be something is to be part of that expedition and go across the United States when it was so pure and it was so grand. They waited for a day and a half for one buffalo herd to cross a creek. I mean, they saw birds darken the sky for six hours, flocks of them so big that they just blocked out the sun. I mean, the wildlife and the natural wonders they saw, and for them to see it for the first time, it was so amazing. And the reason it all happened is because Napoleon ran out of money. Napoleon ran out of money, and, and he sent a message, which went very slowly, they didn't have internet back then, to Jefferson that he was willing to sell what we know now as Louisiana p a Purchase which is a great big swath. It's about one-third of the United States. And it was like a million dollars. It wasn't a lot of money. No, I think we bought Alaska from the Russians for a million. How much did we pay for Greenland? I forgot. Oh, no, that hasn't happened yet. I'm sorry. That's another one. Anyway, so it may have been, you know, a few million dollars. It was nothing. And he's buying, he's buying a third of the U.S., from the French and Jefferson. He had to work on Congress and say so bought it. So he gets this expedition together. He says, we bought it, but we don't know what it is. So we got to look at it. So he gets these 43 men, 1804 to 1806, and he sends them. They start, you know, by foot in Pittsburgh, but the but mission really begins St. Louis. And they end up going all the way to the Pacific Ocean. They're looking for, first of all, they wanted to make sure they claim it before the British and the Spanish did. Uh, secondly, they wanted to find out 
Jefferson, he was a scientist and a farmer. He said, Take, get the animals and the plants and find out what's going on with the country, what, what kind of wildlife there is, and make some notes, and, and then to establish trade with the native tribes along the way. And so they took off on this journey. It was just such an epic adventure. And to live with them and see the wonders that they saw and the courage, never knowing what was around the next bend. Some of the Indians told them, they said, yeah, as you go west, you're going to see some big bears. And they said, yeah. You know, they were used to all the black bears in Kentucky, you know, little teddy bears. <laughs> Indians said, no, these are big bears. And they were very curious, Lewis writes, very curious to find out what these big bears were. They said, we got Kentucky rifles. We're not afraid of any big bears. And Mary Le Weather Lewis and one of the hunters were out looking for game, and they ran into their first grizzly. And uh, along the way, they had to shoot two or three grizzlies. And they, they got chased by them. And they had to unload like half of their rifles into one bear. And Lewis records, the curiosity of the men has been fully satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful story of how they barely, only one man died, appendicitis of all things. It was an incredible journey, 8,000 miles. And uh, they... They were hoping they'd find a waterway across the Northwest Passage. They didn't. But one of the reasons Jefferson did that, he was thinking about a story in the Bible. You know, Jefferson didn't believe all the miracles in the Bible, but he did believe the Bible was a historical book. And he read where the children of Israel were going to take possession of a land that God had given them, but they had not looked at it in generations, and nobody, including Moses, had ever been there. And he said, we got to send an expedition to find out what it is. And we're going to go to that story in the Bible. So if you have your Bibles, you might want to turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. And I'll start with verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan that I am giving to the children of Israel. From each man of the fathers, you'll send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran, according to the command of the Lord, all of them who were heads of the children of Israel. They basically sent one leader, maybe democratically chosen, from each tribe. And I'm not going to even read all the names of the characters that were chosen because they sort of evaporated into uh, insignificance in history with the exception of two names. You had one by the name of Caleb from the tribe of Judah, and you had Joshua from the tribe of Ephraim. And so then you can pick it up here in Numbers chapter 13, verse 17. So Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. And he said to them, go up this way into the south, go into the mountains, see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak few or many, whether the land they live in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps, villages, or strongholds, cities, whether the land is rich or poor, whether there are forests or not, be of good courage, don't be afraid, and bring some of the fruit, bring samples back. Now the time was the season of first ripe grapes. So in obedience with their commission, they went up and they spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south, and they came to Hebron, Ahiam, Sheshiah, and Talmai. The descendants of Anak were there. Now, Anak is a king who has a bed that's 13 feet long. Goliath is only nine and a half feet. So when they talk later about the Anakim, just be thinking a race of giants. Now the Anakim were there. Then they came to the valley of Eshcol, I'm in verse 23, and there they cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes, the word Eshcol means cluster, that was so big, they carried it between two of them on a pole. Can you imagine that? You invite somebody over for breakfast, say, you want a grape? <laughs> Not a grapefruit, a grape. These were huge. That's why they called it a land flowing with milk and honey. It literally was a land. It's not just a figure of speech or a metaphor. You can read in the Bible that when Jonathan was going through the woods during a war, it says, honey dripped from the trees and puddled on the ground, and he stuck his pole in it. You remember that? 
And there was so much vegetation, greenery, and flowers that the goats and the cows, when they ate, their udders would squirt milk as they walked. It doesn't say that, but I'm imagining that <laughs> because I used to have goats. And if you didn't milk them on time, they'd start without me. <laughs> it's true. So, land flowing with milk and honey. And so it says they um, cut down that big cluster of grapes and they brought some of the pomegranates in the figs. And the place was called the Valley of Eshkol because of the grapes that they cut down there. And they returned from spying the land after 40 days. And they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of Israel in the wilderness of Paradon at Kadesh Barnea. They brought back word to them. Now, I've got to just pause here and tell you that there is a big difference between two of them and ten of them. Two of the spies, as they crossed over the Jordan River and they saw the land around Jericho, they said, well, you look at those springs of water. Look at the date trees and the palms. What a beautiful place. It's an oasis. Ten of them said, look at the people. Look at their fortifications. Look at the walls. How could we ever conquer a city with walls that big? And it was that way the whole trip for 40 days. You had two people that had a lot of good news and 10 people that had a lot of bad news. Two of them were very positive and believed. Ten of them only saw the obstacles and the problems. They came up to the area of Hebron where the Anakim lived. And the people, ten of the spies said, oh, look at this, this is a race of giants. We're like grasshoppers. How can we conquer people like this? They're huge. We've never fought anyone like this. There's no one like this in Egypt. And Caleb says, wow, look at the rich soil. Look at the springs of water. And they go up into the land of the north, Carmel, not too far from Eshkol. And, uh, and they see the Amalekites and the Jebusites and the Hittites and the Termites. And they see all these different nations. And... <laughs> And they say, how could we conquer all of these nations? <laughs> and that's where they cut down the cluster of grapes. And it says two of them carried it. Which two do you think are doing it? <laughs> Joshua and Caleb said, oh, we got to take these back to the camp. I, I, we got to do it before it turns into raisins. So right after they, <laughs> they cut the cluster, they said, let's head back now. And their pockets are bulging. Joshua and Caleb, they're, they're, you know, they got figs and they got pomegranates and pomelos and dates and there's probably a cloud of fruit flies following them <laughs> as they head back down towards the children of Israel. And they're so excited. Now they're also, they're smart and they know, like these guys are just bad news. All they see is the problems. And they said, we better get there and set the tone before they start talking. Or they're going to bring everybody down. They're just, everything they see is a problem, a problem, obstacle, problem. And Joshua and Caleb said, look, this is the promised land. It's called the promised land because God promised to give it to us. Why would God promise to give it to us if He couldn't give it to us? You know, most people agree that Jesus, believers, came and died for the sins of the world. But even among Christians, there's still a lot of people that doubt that He's big enough to save them. They say, I hope to be saved. It might be nice, but I'm such a sinner. They have more faith in their sin than God's power to save. They think the devil is good at tempting them and they know how easy it is to fall into temptation but they lack faith that Jesus is able to keep them. So in reality, their devil is bigger than their savior. So Joshua and Caleb outrun the other 10 negative spies. They're supposed to be bringing a report of how wonderful the promised land is and they're going to tell them how inaccessible the promised land is. God have mercy if any pastors ever do that. We're supposed to be messengers that tell people you can make it. So notice what happens. They came back to the children of Israel, to the congregation. They showed them the fruit of the land. I'm in verse 27, Numbers 13, 27. And they told him and they said, we went to the land you sent us and truly it flows with milk and honey and this is the fruit. And I just can picture that Caleb and Joshua plucking off grapes and saying, dodge, heads up, here comes another, heads up. And they're throwing grapes and dates and pomelos and figs and things that everybody, they're having a food fight. And everyone's going, oh, look at all the fruit, this is wonderful. And they're rejoicing. And then the other 10 
came dragging in. You notice instantly the conversation changes. They butt and say, wait, wait, don't get too excited. Verse 28, nevertheless, people who dwell in the land are strong and the cities are fortified and very large. And they started talking about the walls of Jericho and they say, we'll never be able to knock down those walls. They had no idea that God's got a thousand ways to deal with our problems when we can't see one. And by the way, God is not always going to give you the answer to your problem before you need it. You can't move forward with the Lord and say, I'm not going to take a step until I know how it's all going to work out. God very often does not supply what you need until the very moment you need it. People sometimes ask me, Pastor Doug, do you think you have enough faith to die, be tortured for Christ? I said, not now I don't. <laughs> but I'm hoping if heaven forbid that ever happens, I trust that He will then give it to me when I need it. But I'm not going to worry about having it now because I spend my whole life worried about it. Instead, I want to believe that God's going to give me what I need when I need it. Yeah. And how many times in your life, at the last minute, God moves the mountain, He parts the water, and you, then you say, oh, Lord, why did I not believe sooner that you could provide for me when the time comes? I remember hearing about a story. My father was a pilot in World War II. He flew during D-Day in Europe, but this is a story from the Pacific. And um, some soldiers ran out of fuel flying, some pilots and a crew, uh, in Japanese-held territory. And the only place they could put down the plane, they just sputtered in, running out of fuel. They sputtered in, they landed on an abandoned field, but it was an island that the other end of the island was held by the Japanese. They know the Japanese spies saw them come in, and they knew it'd only be a matter of a day or so before they got from one end of the island to the other to arrest them. They, were, they had no lifeboats or anything to get away, and, and they nearly despaired. They're just waiting to thought either be killed or be captured and spend the rest of the war in a uh, prison of war camp. But there was a chaplain in the group. He said, men, we shouldn't lose hope. They're all saying, this is where we're going to go. We're out of fuel. There's nothing we can do. So let's pray. And he encouraged them all to come together, and they had a prayer meeting. And so they prayed, and eventually some of them drifted off to sleep. And then the next morning, one of the sailors just felt impressed to go up and walk along the beach. And he went up from the, the um, dirt field where they landed, went down to the beach, started walking along, and he saw something bobbing in the water. And it was a large canister of aviation fuel. And he went and hooted, woke up his friends. They came and they wrestled this can up the shore and up onto the field. And they somehow pumped it into the wings. And they had enough runway to take off, barely clipping the palm trees. And they uh, escaped to friendly territory. Before they took off, one of them took a note of the serial number and wrote it down of the can. And it turns out the can had been jettisoned by another ship when they realized they were, under, uh, they were carrying fuel and a whole bunch of tanks had been jettisoned by another American ship when it was under a, uh, a torpedo attack from the Japanese a thousand miles away. And none of the other cans was ever recovered. And this can somehow drifted a thousand miles. It went by 25 other islands. And it washed up on the shore of the pilots that needed it the morning after they prayed. God always gives you what you need at the very minute you need it. All things are possible with God. Oh, they said, we can't, ten of the spies, we can't do it. We saw the descendants of Anak there, verse 29. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites, how little did they know that one of the most famous Israeli soldiers was going to be Uriah the Hittite. They thought they were enemies. They even converted some of them. The Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of Jordan. And they were so depressed and so discouraged and spent so much time focusing on the problems and all the people are passing along the bad news. Pretty soon this cloud of discouragement and unbelief swept over the whole congregation. Now keep in mind, these are the people who had just escaped from the mightiest empire in the world. Through the power of God, they had seen ten plagues unlike anything you'd ever seen fall on their enemies. God had taken them by the hand with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, 
He brought down plagues on their enemies. And through the seven last plagues, you know there were ten plagues that fell on Egypt. The Israelis experienced the first three of the ten. But he protected them from the last seven plagues. How many plagues does Revelation talk about? Seven. Are you worried about that tribulation? Did God protect them through that tribulation? Will he save us through that tribulation? And they said, we'll never make it. And all the people of Israel began to get discouraged. They began to lift up their voices and cry. And you read in verse 30, Caleb quieted the people before Moses. Now, why do you have to quiet them? They're all moaning and saying, oh, we vey, we're never going to make it. Why did God bring us? They forgot all the miracles. They forgot the bread from heaven they saw every morning. They forgot the glory of God was within sight. You know, if you listen to the devil for five minutes, you can forget a whole lifetime of victory. <laughs> it's amazing how quickly we can forget all our blessings and focus on, on one little dot of discouragement. And he had to quiet the people because he could say they were moaning and losing faith. And he said, let us go up. Not only let us go up, let us go up at once and take it. He had just come back from, you think he'd want to spend the night. He had just come back from a 40-day expedition. He said, let us go up once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Well, one of the first evangelistic meetings I ever went to was in the little town of Covalo, an evangelist named Monty Jones. And, and that's where I first heard the song, He's Able. And, you know, for some of you who grew up in the church, you heard it for years. I'd never heard it before. That's a great song. He's able, he's able, I know he's able. So I started doing it at all our evangelistic meetings. You ever watch Net New York and some of the others? We always sing, he's able. We've got to remember he is able. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able. <laughs> so you've got to make up your mind. Who are you going to believe? The majority or the faithful minority. What's our message about? Living above the crowd? Now wait a second. How many of those spies were church members? No, Pastor Doug, tell me it ain't so. <laughs> that, that they were leaders. It says they picked everyone, a leader among them. And they started telling the people, no, you can't do it. The enemy's too big. And they said, you know, let's just get comfortable right here in the desert forever. Or let's go back to Egypt and be slaves. That's what their options were. And you know, I'm shocked as I go around and I hear people say, well, I know that Jesus comes to forgive our sins, but he doesn't really expect us to like, uh, stop sinning. I mean, does he, does he expect us to have like victory over sin? Let's not get carried away. I mean, he's not able to do that. Can the devil tempt us to sin? Yeah, of course the devil. He's really good at what he does. But can God save us from sin? Oh, no. The Amalekites are too big. And the Jebusites and the Hittites and all of them, are, they're too big. The Hemites and the Hurites and all of them are too big. And we can't, we can't overcome. So Joshua said, we are well able. Caleb said, we are well able. The others said, we are not able. You and I are faced with who you want to believe today. Bible tells me, <laughs> angel comes to Zechariah, he comes to Mary. They said, how can these things be? Zechariah says, we're too old. Angel said, you should have believed. Now you're not going to get to say anything until John's born. <laughs> Mary says, but I'm not married yet. And the angel says, with God all things are possible. All things are possible with God. I can do all things through Christ. You know, I, I get so exasperated because... When I came to the Lord, you know, I was, I was drinking and smoking and stealing and cursing and, I mean, I was just, you know, I, I was a big zero. Um, I think it's Martin Luther that said, God creates from nothing, so until you become nothing, He can do nothing with you. <laughs> and once you realize you've reached the bottom and you surrender and you are crucified with Christ, He can recreate you then and make you a new creature. But you must be broken. He that falls on the rock and is broken, there's hope for him. And God help me quit smoking and drinking and cursing. And it's not because I don't have the freedom to do those things. And you know what? I know what all the curse words are. I still remember them. <laughs> I don't say them. I don't think about them. Because I'm a new person now. 
And so when people start telling me and making all these excuses for sin, I just think, I don't want to hear that. Don't tell me you can't with Christ. Because I'll tell you what the rest of the story is. If you don't believe you can, then you can't. Jesus said, be it unto you according to your faith. All things are possible to him that believes. But the men who had gone up said, we are not able. The people are stronger than we. Well, he was right, but that doesn't matter. Yeah, they did not have as much military experience. They were outnumbered. They were underfortified. But none of that matters because you and God are always a majority. The Bible promise is that one of you will chase a thousand. So the numbers never mattered. Jonathan and his armor bearer go up against the Philistines and Jonathan says to his armor bearer, there is no restraint with the Lord to deliver by few or many. And I realize we're terribly outnumbered, but I think with God we can take on that garrison. So the two of them take on a garrison of Philistines and they win and they both survive and the Philistines fall. Because they believe. It, don't underestimate what God can do. And is there any area in your life that you've not conquered the Hittites and the Jebusites and you've just gotten comfortable? You know, when the children of Israel entered the promised land, God said, now don't let up until you've driven them out. Because if you don't drive them out, they will be thorns in your side and splinters in your eyes. And you know, after they got comfortable in the land, they said, well, you know, we've kind of whittled them down to size. We don't need to drive them completely out. Moses said, don't do that because you're going to start making alliances with them and your sons are going to marry them. They're going to start eroding your faith. You don't settle until you've driven them out and you are free indeed. You know what's happened to the church is we got comfortable with a little bit of the world and started compromising with the world. Started thinking, wow. Well, and you know what? It, those nations, while they weren't watching, those nations began to grow again. And they started intermarrying with their children. And they started compromising their beliefs. And next thing you know, they were worshiping their gods. And it all happened in the promised land. Because they began to settle for too little. God said, I want you to have complete victory. I said, oh, we better tolerate some enemies among us. Is there any area in your life where the devil still has a foothold? If the sun will make you free, you shall be free indeed. You got to believe either the ten spies or the two. You need to live above the crowd. Don't, sometimes you can't always go with the majority report. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the promised land. Can you imagine that? The gospel is good news. How do you communicate the gospel to others? Do they look at you and think, I want to be a Christian like them because they're so happy, because they're joyful? Do you look like, the Christian, like Christianity is good news when people meet you, when they talk to you? Do you talk about the positive side of life? Are you always focusing on what's wrong, what's wrong with everybody and everything? I heard a pastor say once that uh, some Christians look like they've been baptized in pickle juice. <laughs> and they were supposed to be on our way to a feast, not a funeral. Right? Amen. Spurgeon, when he would train ministers, he'd say, when you preach, your face should reflect the subject you're talking about. For example, if you're talking about heaven and you describe the golden streets, your face should shine. If you talk about the pearly gates, your eyes should sparkle. And he said, and if you're preaching on the subject of hell, use your regular everyday expression. <laughs> the gospel is good news. And here you got one group that says, oh, the land through which we went, it devours the inhabitants. It's like the land, you know, they were going to cross over and start getting gobbled up by the, the plants or something. It's a land that devours the inhabitants. Well, Caleb and Joshua said, it's flowing with milk and honey. Which is it? All the people that we saw there like men of great stature. We saw the giants, the descendants of Anak. We were like grasshoppers in our own sight. Notice it began with their own sight. That was the problem. They saw themselves as grasshoppers. And then it says, and in their sight. Well, the reason they look like grasshoppers in their sight is because they saw themselves as grasshoppers. 
You know, uh, I think it was John Wesley kind of turned the Christian world upside down. Um, he was like five feet two. And some people would comment on his uh, diminutive, diminutive size. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter how big the dog is in the fight. It matters how big the fight is in the dog. <laughs> and he just turned the Christian world upside down. He never let up. Went until he was 87 years old, preaching and teaching. Started a whole movement and a great revival. Can't be thinking of yourself that way. You know the story of David and Goliath. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, this champion of the Philistines comes marching down into the valley of Elah and he begins, you know, the Philistines and Israelites are always basing off against each other. Philistines occupied a big swath of land uh, between the mountains and the sea. It's beautiful farmland. And the um, Israelites, especially the people of Judah, were up in the mountains above. And they were always facing off for battles. And they armed themselves on each side of this valley, kind of waiting to engage and taunting each other. And they kind of had no man's land in between them. And and out of the Philistine camp came marching this guy that was a virtual redwood tree. He came thundering down. Now, he's around, depending on what cubit you use, Egyptian cubit or Hebrew cubit or Babylon cubit, I don't know what cubit they were using, but he's at least like nine and a half feet tall. And he's not like some people who are real tall and real spindly. He's like Shaquille O'Neal, you know. He's symmetrically huge. And uh, he comes marching down. He issues a challenge that never heard any army do this before. They said, look, why do we all need to die in battle? Let's just have you send out your best man. We'll send out our best man. And whoever wins, that nation will pay tribute to the other nation. You become our servants. Well, they didn't know what to say. They didn't want to say, no, we don't have anyone that can take on your best man. And so day after day, for 40 days, Goliath comes down and he taunts them and he says, come on, send me, man. Don't you have one man who's willing to fight? Is there not one man? And I used to wonder, why didn't Saul go fight him? The Bible says Saul was a head and shoulders taller than everyone else. That would give you an edge. Jonathan had faith, but I don't think Saul was going to let the crown prince go fight him. The Bible tells us that when Samuel went to pick David and anoint him, first Samuel put his eyes on Eliab, David's older brother, and he was tall also. And he said, oh, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. God said, don't look on his height. Don't look on how big he is on the outside. Look at how big he is on the inside. And he ends up with David, who just so happened to be my height. <laughs> no, I don't know. <laughs> and so after this goes on for 39 days, Jesse says, David, look, your brothers are on the front lines. You better bring them some provisions. And David comes to the front lines, and just at about the time he's handing out provisions to his brothers, Goliath comes storming down. He issues his challenge, and every time he comes, he's taunting more than ever. He's mocking the God of Israel, and David hears this, and he's looking around. He's thinking, we're just going to stand and take this? Isn't anybody? This righteous indignation, spirit-inspired, wells up within David, and he thinks, isn't anybody going to speak up for the glory of God against these heathen? And nobody. And finally, David said, what's the reward for the guy who takes him out? He already had his mind made up of no one's going to do it. I'm going to do it. I just wonder, what's the reward? Oh, he'll be tax-free in Israel. King will probably give him his daughter to marry. And that ended up backfiring, but it, it did work. And uh, pretty soon, word gets to Saul, there's this whippersnapper from Bethlehem who's come out saying he's going to take on the giant. And Saul's thinking, is that my musician? Bring him to me. And David says, look, why would you let this giant in intimidate you? He said, um, a bear came and took... Um, Sheep, I killed the bear. A lion came, I killed the lion. And you know, it doesn't say David killed the lion with a sling. We always portray it that way. It says, I took him by the beard. The Holy Spirit came on David like it came on Samson. You know, Samson never... Show me where it says Samson had big muscles. Samson actually was five feet nine. Well, we don't know that. It doesn't say that exactly. 
But it does say when the Spirit of the Lord left him, he was as other men. Doesn't it? So what made the difference? How big the fight is in the dog. How big the faith is in the believer is what makes the difference. He said, I'll go fight this giant. Now Saul is thinking, well, if we send out our best man and he gets beat, we're just going to look bad and we'll have to be their slaves. If we send out a kid, we may still have to be their slaves, but we won't feel bad because, you know, at least uh, they're going to feel bad. And he said, all right, uh, I'm inspired by your optimism. You can go. And then Saul tries to put his armor on David. And, and you know, Saul is a head and shoulders taller than everyone else. He puts on Saul's armor and he's probably peeking out the neck hole like this. And he <laughs> says he essayed to go. That means he tried to walk and he's like, you know, he says, I'm like a fight the giant in this stuff. He says, I'm dead before I get out of the, the field. And so he takes the five smooth stones. See, everyone else saw a giant that was nine and a half feet. David knew he was only five feet, 54 inches. <laughs> it's a matter of perspective. <laughs> and David didn't even know how he was going to do it. He knew he was pretty good with a sling. You know, the Bible tells us that there were some Benjamites. Now, David was from Judah, but the Bible does say in the book of Judges there were some Benjamites that could sling stones left-handed at a hair's breadth and not miss. And I had a friend that lived in Alaska, and some of the uh, Inuits up there, they would sling stones. And they said, you could put a stone, if you picked your stone carefully, you could put it through a half-inch piece of plywood. Those things really have pretty good muzzle velocity. So David carefully picked five smooth stones, and I can just see it. Goliath's on the other side of the mountains, and they're all taunting and mocking, and one army's arrayed against another, and David walks down to this creek between the two, and he starts fishing around in the water, and he picks out what he knows will be good projectiles, and he gets five, and someone said, if David had so much faith, why didn't he just get one? Well, you read on in the Bible, you find out Goliath had four other relatives that were giants. <laughs> David figured if they showed up, he'd be ready for any of them. And Goliath comes out and he sees this boy. He thinks he's bringing a message. He sees the fight in David's eyes and he thinks, you've got to be kidding. And David's got his shepherd's staff. And Goliath says, what? No armor? You won't even send me someone to kill that's got armor on? He said, what am I, a dog? You come against me with a stick? And Goliath begins to stomp around and stir up the dust and he's shouting and cursing by the Philistine gods. I'm going to take your head off of you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to feed you to the buzzards and the skunks and... And now, if you're going to fight a giant, don't make him mad first, right? <laughs> David doesn't, he doesn't back down one bit. The courage, the audacity, the boldness, the faith. He said, no, 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 let me tell you how this is going to end. So I'm going to kill you. And I'm going to take your head from you. And you come against me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come against you with something much bigger than anything you've got. I come against you in the name of God. Amen. And you and God are always the winning team. Amen. Now, has Goliath ever taunted you? Have you ever felt like the devil was too big? What does David use to bring down the giant? The stone. Jesus said, he that hears these words of mine and does them is like a wise man who's building his house on what? Rock. Rock. Christ is that rock. In the story, that giant image is brought down. It is a stone representing Christ, His kingdom, His word. The Ten Commandments were written on what? Stone. stone. How do we bring down the enemy? How did Jesus fight the devil? It is written. It is written. It is written. In the word of God is the weapon, it's the sword that we need to defeat the enemy. There are promises, exceeding great and precious promises in His word that you can use to bring down every giant every foreign tribe that is in your mind and heart. God wants you to be free indeed. You must believe that He is able. Can you say amen? amen? So, David comes out against Goliath. The Bible says the giant went to meet David. He walked out. And this has always fascinated me. I think I mentioned it earlier this week. David ran to meet the giant. 
Goliath was so outraged at the insults of David, he thought, who in the world does he think he is? David's thinking, Lord, you've got to help me now because I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't even have a sword. What am I going to do, kick him in the knee? And Goliath takes his helmet and he pushes it back and he thinks, oh. And David says, ah, bullseye. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I was praying for an opening and he gave me the opening I needed. And David was so good, it says, as he ran, he put his hand in his bag. You know, I'll tell you, I, I told you I like reading history. And I was reading about some of the Indian battles. And these were the Native Americans fighting with Native Americans, and they were so good. They would ride a horse, draw arrows, and shoot them, and not miss while they're bouncing on a horse. You think, how in the world do you do that? These slingers that used to, they could run, load a sling, fire it, and not miss while they're on the move. I'd trip and wrap my feet up and I'd, I'd never be able to do that. <laughs> and as David's running, he takes that stone, he puts it in, he whips it around his head and he sends that thing just shooting like a bullet right in its mark and it absolutely knocks Goliath out. He hits it, I like reading this in the book Patriarchs and Prophets, all of a sudden he's, he's shocked and he grabs his forehead and the blood almost instantly begins to come out between his finger and he stumbles and you know the expression the bigger they are and he starts to just go over and David said timber <laughs> <laughs> he, he starts to go over and went face down ingloriously in the, in the dirt and you know when I get to heaven there's certain videos I want to check out I'm going to take my angel, I'm going to say, where do you get this archive? I said, I want to see this. <laughs> and I not only want to see what happened, I want to see the faces of the Philistines. I want to see their faces. Go, yeah, Goliath, go. go. <laughs> <laughs> the disbelief. And then in the Israeli army, they're all going, so how long do you think that uh, that son of Jesse is going to last? Well, I don't know. I think he's got 20 seconds. What do you think? I'll give him 30 seconds. And they're taking money on that. He's gonna, how long before he's snuffed out, you know? And then they see Goliath go down. And all the Israelite soldiers are going, huh? <laughs> Even his own people. And there was probably a long, awkward silence. Then nobody's doing anything. David says, you guys aren't going to help me. He goes and he takes Goliath's sword. He's still kind of moaning. He's not dead yet. And he cuts off the giant's head, lifts it up. Finally, the people are going, I don't think he's getting back up. <laughs> <laughs> and the Israelites go, yeah, he's ours. We were on his side the whole time. <laughs> we knew he could do it. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the king's harpist. <laughs> the shepherd boy. And they all go charging down the hill towards the Philistines. And the Philistines, they threw their weapons in the air and they thought, man, if the young guy can do that to our biggest man, what are these guys going to do to us? And they went running back. They got a victory. You and God. David said, you come against me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come against you in the name of Jehovah. Amen. So if you are met with temptation... And you call out to God and you say, Lord, save me, like Peter when he's sinking. God would sooner empty heaven of every angel than let one of his children that trusts in him fail when they believe. And you might be looking at yourself saying, Lord, I'm not much. How am I going to make it? Romans chapter 4, 17 says, God calls those things that are not as though they are. God calls us saints. He calls us his children. He says, I've gone to prepare a place for you before anyone's earned that place. All things are possible to them that believe. Now to go back to my story. So, in the book of Numbers, one group said we can make it, the other group said we can't make it. And all the congregation, chapter 14, they lift up their voices, they weep all night. They say, let's kill Moses and Aaron. Let's go back to Egypt We'll go back and be slaves. Believers who would rather be slaves than be free. We don't believe we can make it. It's too hard to be a Christian. Well, the, the only thing that's scaring them is the devil. 
I'll tell you, friends, it's a lot easier being saved than being lost. Amen. The devil got us convinced that it's easier to surrender and be a slave. And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces, and Caleb, the son of Jephani, he said, the land through which we passed is an exceeding good land, verse 8. If the Lord delights in us, He will bring us into this land and give it to us. It flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Don't stop believing the Lord. Jesus said, where is your faith? How many times did He ask the apostles, where is your faith? So often we focus on what we can't do. A couple of quotes I'd like to share for you before I run out of time here. Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There's no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends, George Mueller. Unbelief puts our circumstances between us and God, but faith puts God between us and our circumstances. Sometimes we focus on the giant and not the Lord. Viktor Frankl said, a weak faith is weakened by predicaments and catastrophes, whereas a strong faith is strengthened by them. And then some anonymous person said, faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. If you believe, you will receive. Even if you've fallen ten times before, a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. Don't stop believing that the Lord can finish what He started in your life. He is the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen? Amen. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it. Don't believe the lies out there that say, oh, nobody's perfect. We can't make it. We're all going to fall. You strive to be like Christ. That's what a Christian is. Amen? Amen? We're followers of Jesus. Keep our eyes fixed on Him. How do we lay aside the sin and the weight? Fixing our eyes. Setting our eyes on Jesus. We run that race with endurance, remembering that He was crucified in our behalf. So, you go over to the book of Joshua, and we need to fast forward 40 years. The ones you said were not going to make it, you read in chapter 14, guess what happens? They didn't make it. Those 10 spies who said, oh, oh it's, we're never going to make it, God said, out of your own mouth, I'm going to judge you. That generation that said, oh, better off that we had died in the wilderness, God said, oh, be careful what you ask for. That generation that didn't believe they could make it died in the wilderness. But their kids learned a few lessons. They had childlike faith. That next generation went in. And the only two that were over 60 that made it into the promised land were the two spies that believed they could make it. And then after five years of fighting and battling in the promised land, Joshua comes to Caleb. And this is chapter 14 of the book of Joshua. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb, the son of Jephani, the Kenazite, he said to him, you know the word that the Lord said uh, through Moses, the man of God concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was 40, year old, 40 years old when Moses, the servant of, of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought back word to him as was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me, they made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly follow the Lord my God. So Moses swore to me on that day, saying, Surely the land that your foot has trodden on will be an inheritance for you and your children forever because you've wholly followed the Lord. Can I just tell you what that word follow means? You wholly believed. That's what it's saying. Jesus says, follow me. He says, believe me. And he says, and behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. So now he's how old? 85. Ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses, and now here I am this day, 85 years old, and I am as strong this day as I was on that day. Wouldn't you like to have that problem? <laughs> that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so is my strength now both for war, for going out, for coming in. Now, therefore, give me this mountain. Jesus said, if you've got faith, what can you do? You can say to this mountain, be plucked up and cast into the sea, and it'll be done. Give me this mountain that God promised, even though the giants are there. And Joshua blessed him. And Caleb, the son of Jephani, he went with the tribe of Judah. They went into the mountains of Hebron, later known as the hills of Judea, and they took on the giants. 
and they trounced them. And to this day, there's a city in the land of Judah called Jerusalem. And David, who is a descendant for, from Judah, they all possessed that land because an old man had faith that God can do what he's promised. Now, he had to wait a little while to get the full promise, didn't he? He had to wander in the wilderness for a little while. But did Caleb get everything that God promised him? And sometimes it might feel like our wandering is going a little long. But if you believe he is able, he will finish the work that he's begun in your life. God is faithful. Can you say amen? amen. Great is his faithfulness. He will not let you down. All things are possible to him that believes. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If you come to God, you must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Daniel was delivered from the lion's den because he believed in his God. That's what it says, Daniel chapter 6. And so Jesus said, where is your faith? Would you like more faith? Amen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God will give us faith when we ask him. Would you like to have that kind of saving faith, that kind of faith where you can take out the giants? Yes. Let's ask him together. And I want to invite those who are watching as we close with prayer, pray for that faith. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the abundant promises we see in your word, just from Genesis to Revelation, that all things are possible to those that believe. I pray that we'll do what we can, Lord, to fortify our minds with the truth of your word, that when those giants show themselves through your promises, we might experience...